everyone. Uh, you know, it's my pleasure to introduce to you today Aaron Camarada from Void Alpha. Uh, so I met Aaron through a uh, research project that we are both involved in. We're two different performers on uh, a project where we are trying to create games that, by playing the game, you help people do a formal verification of the correctness of a piece of software. And so, in general, the technique is you take the software, you make some kind of uh, mathematical model of that software, and then once you have that mathematical model, you can ask that model questions like, are there any buffer overflows? Or every string that I send to the database, has that been checked by a SQL injection attack checker uh, before sending it along. Uh, so there are a number of you know, very interesting and important properties that you can determine with formal verification, um, but one of the challenging things is actually coming up with that mathematical model. So we're both working on games to try and come up with these mathematical models, uh, essentially doing a, a crowdsourcing of that effort. Um, so uh, that's how I met Aaron. Um, you know, I'm sure you'll hear more about these games in the future, but at the moment we sort of can't really talk about them and they're still under development uh, and so on. <laughs> um, but speaking of development, uh, you know, we certainly um, for our game here are looking for somebody to do game programming. Uh, and so I sent an email out recently and if anyone is interested in uh, doing essentially an, an internship-like experience here on campus, uh, we're looking for somebody to do flash game programming on this project. Um, and the idea is that you would uh, come up to speed over this quarter, and if all goes well, um, it is something that could turn into an opportunity over the summer. So we're looking for one, possibly two people um, to do that. So if you're interested, either see me or see um, uh, John Murray from UC Santa Cruz, who's in the back. John, can you wave your hand? So uh, anyway, there he is. He's, uh, uh, I don't know if he's the tallest person in the room, but he's probably, probably close. So anyway, see him at the end, uh, and either of us can tell you more about that. So, Without any further ado, let me turn the stage over to Aaron. So, hey, thank you. All right. Uh, thanks a lot for coming out and sharing your early Friday morning with me. I remember what it was like to be in college. So, uh, um, I'm here today to talk to you about game design freelancing. Um, and the talk uh, is something that I gave two weeks ago, actually today, at GDC. Two weeks or three? Anyway, a few weeks ago. <laughs> Um, and the reason that I wanted to give it is because um, in 2011 my company closed the California studio where I was working. Um, I'm a game designer. I've been in the industry since like 1995. Um, and I've been a game designer. My degree is in computer science, so you know I started as a coder. I still you know code every day. Um, but my passion has always been studying and understanding what makes a game great and, and how to look at a game and see what's broken about it and fix it. Um, and so that, that's really my passion. Um, I worked at Activision, Neversoft, um, THQ. I worked on Tony Hawk's Pro Skater, a couple of Pixar titles and stuff like that. And what I want to share with you is, you know, I found that when my you know, studio closed, I, I went out to a bunch of people to try and find a job. And they essentially, a lot of them said, you know, we don't need a creative director or somebody sort of at that level, but man, great skills. Can you just come and do this little bit of work for us? So I sort of tripped and fell into, into freelancing as a game designer and made a bunch of mistakes and I wanted to show you what some of those mistakes were so that if you had any thoughts about going into contract work on your own, whether it be game design, engineering, art, or whatever, um, I'm gonna try to, to draw out some of the commonalities there as well. Um, so before we get too into the talk, um, I'd like to give you, a, a, I'm looking around for something that expresses what it felt like to me to get into the game industry and, and sort of connect with you guys on like how, how cool that moment is. Um, oh, but first, that was the game design, that was the GDC talk. This is the better UC Santa Cruz talk. <laughs> Uh, you're welcome. Um, we're not going to keep. And what I mean is, we're not going to keep it focused to just game design. It's going to, like I said, go into you know engineering. A lot of these uh, things are uh, are sort of broader than that, and um, there'll be more time for questions and discussion as well. Now, on to on to what it feels like to get into the game industry. Volume. Yeah, that's me in Tony Hawk days, and you go, oh my god, I got a job, I'm a game designer, oh my god, crunch, oh, they canceled my crunch. <laughs> okay, 
So now that I've failed that big in front of you, I can't do any worse for the rest of the talk, right? Okay, but so let's take a moment and so that I can understand a little bit about where you're coming from. Um, how many folks here want to get a job in the game industry? Okay, good. <laughs> how many want to get a job as a designer? Okay, as an engineer? Okay, artist? Um, QA? Oh, dude, really? <laughs> oh, good for you. Um, it's, it's very difficult, uh, but you know what? That's good, that's excellent. You get to play the games all the time, right? Um, so, uh, the specifically, how many of you had thought before today to be a freelancer in the game industry? Okay, actually, a few, that's good. Um, the other thing that I'm going to do to expand this talk is to make it a little bit less about freelancing and contracting because a lot of this stuff applies to a career. And I'll try to, uh, you know, on each slide and each point, I'll try to point out uh, where it may be applicable, whether you're freelancing or you're employed or, or whatever. So, thank you for that. So, the first thing that I wanted to get across is the good news is you can be a contract game designer. You can be a contract game developer. The question that you need to ask yourself first is should you? Um, being a freelancer, this is obviously the sort of freelancery specific part. There's a couple of... Um, there's a couple of things that I, when I was working as a contractor and, and talking to other contractors, the ones that flamed out tended to have certain properties in common and the ones who seemed to be able to keep their head above water had other, uh, different properties in common. The first question you need to ask yourself is can you put it down? When you're a freelancer, you are a business owner. You are responsible for finding work, for keeping your current clients happy, for keeping your past clients happy, for, oh, that's right, I need to get that bid out to that new person who I might get work with. Uh, I have that email, I have to finish the work I have to do for my current clients. It is up to you and not the clock or your boss to say, okay, it's 8 o'clock at night on a Saturday. I'm not working right now. You have to check yourself and see if you're able to say, you know what, I deserve time, time off. I've seen a lot of people flame out because they just they run themselves ragged. Second is, can you get it done no matter what? It's a little bit dark, but that's a car with log wheels. Um, <laughs> and that, that became really true for me. I was building prototypes for um, Pocket Gems. They make iOS games, and they used me to prototype some of their features before they sent it off to development. And I was having a, you know, a memory issue as a result of a race condition at 2 a.m., and it was like, there's no lead engineer down the hall. You're at home. And so uh, it's really tempting to go, I don't know, it's not working. Well, you don't get to walk into the client's office the next day and go, I don't know, I couldn't get it to work. And then they go, oh, I don't know, I forgot how to write a check. So, you know, very important. <laughs> and third, this is specific to designers, um, but I think engineers also get this in code reviews and so on, is can you suck it up? Because game design opinions, right, everybody has one, you can fill in the words. But designers in particular are, are suspect, or, or subject rather, to everybody walking up and saying, your game sucks, man, and they throw it down. And they have no way to tell you how it sucks, or they'll tell you what they think they needed it to be like. Um, and often their suggestions will, will end up making the game worse. Um, the trick is, as a designer, to be able to hear what they're saying and tease out the part that's true. It means they got confused, or it means they got lost, or it means they got you know, frustrated. So can you hear them berating you as a person and go, I think I know how to fix that. <laughs> so those are the three questions you should ask yourself first. Assuming you let yourself pass that little litmus test, you're ready to start getting, you know, getting your business built as a freelancer. Now before you can go out looking for work, you need to get yourself ready. The first thing you need is sort of a support network. You are not going to do everything. The first thing I suggest you do is get some sort of a legal entity. Um, I got an S corporation, you can get them for 800 bucks on, online. I can refer you to a very good guy in Texas. Um, not my brother-in-law or anything like that. Um, an LLC, a C Corp, whatever. Uh, generally, don't do it as a sole proprietor would be my advice. You're gonna need an attorney who you can pick up the phone and call who you trust. And uh, they're going to review every contract that you sign. So you don't wanna be like, oh my God, they want me to do like $150,000 worth of work over the next year. I better find somebody. You want to have that lawyer already on your speed dial. You want to be able to just call them and say, hey, I need you to review this contract for me, and I trust you already. Right, so get that in place first. And of course, you need an accountant, same kind of thing. You don't want to be doing your taxes. You want to be doing game design. 
That's how you make your money, or engineering, or whatever it is, right? So get these people in place uh, before you get started with them. Uh, we have accountant, we have lawyer, attorney. What's the size you're supposed to represent? They are, uh, it says LLC, S Corp, and C Corp. So it's, you need a legal entity. What, the point here is it's a business. This is a company. This is not, you know, Joe going out to get work. Um, don't overlook that. Um, so get yourself, get yourself a corporation because, uh, well, for a lot of reasons that I'm not going to go into, but you know, that, actually that's why you ask your lawyer. <laughs> okay, you also need, obviously, IT structure. You are now the IT department, too. Obviously, you need a computer. I definitely recommend a laptop if you're going to be a freelancer. If you don't already have one, like 90% of you already do. Obviously, you need software, so before you leave, you know, buy education versions of Adobe Creative Suite. If you're going to be a designer, you need Photoshop. You need Flash. You need whatever you're going to do. You also need Word. You need Outlook. You don't need Outlook, but you need, you know, Word for sure to write design docs and so on. You need a printer with a scanner because you need to print out the contract, sign the signature page, and scan it back. So uh, don't overlook the scanner. Also, when your laptop gets coffee spilled on it, you need to get all of your code back very quickly. So get something that backs up your data. I, I like Box myself. We use Bitbucket in production at, um, at Void Alpha. We also use Box in production. Use something that's real. Again, don't go with Dropbox's free plan. Dropbox is for quick and easy, you know, kind of share stuff with friends um, kind of thing. When we've needed to go back to previous versions of things, you need something that's hardened and, and a little bit more sophisticated. You also need your own website, right? You need to do, you need to have something that when somebody says, you know, I met this cool, this cool person at a party last night, I want to learn a little bit more if they could do what we need done. You want them to obviously have a website to go to. And you need a thumb drive because <laughs> you're gonna be at the client's you know, office and you're gonna need to email them something and it's you know 50 megs and oh man, it's not gonna go through email. Just plug it in, give them the thumb drive, get a whole bunch of free ones at GDC or whatever. <laughs> so, uh, okay. So now you're still getting ready. So you notice I'm building this sort of from the bottom up. You don't want to go out there and get all this work and not be ready for it. That's why we're doing the prep stuff up front. The last thing you need to do to get ready, and, and, and probably the hardest part, is financial clarity. You need to know how much money you need to make in order to, consider, you know, to successfully be a contractor. Um, there's a long way to do it. If, if any of you have passed pay stubs from any job, take a look at how much the employer pays in taxes. Take a look at how much they paid for your benefits. Take a look at all that stuff. It's way more than you think. You know, you think, oh, I have a job making $75,000 a year. The employer is paying way more than $75,000 for you to be in that seat. I came up with a shorthand version, though. So this is really good to take with you in your career, sort of no matter what. <coughs> The, um, the shorthand version is, and it does this once in a while, there you go. Your annual salary divided by 1,000 is the hourly rate you want to try and charge as a freelancer. So, if you want to live like you are making $75,000 at EA, you need to charge about $75 an hour as a contractor to have the same quality of life, to pay your own insurance, to pay your own taxes, plus the employer taxes and all that stuff. So that's the shorthand version. Um, that, that kind of goes with um, the contractor side, but many of you, I predict, are going to get into the game industry and hire contractors. So when you're valuing whether that person is, you know, is worth that much money, you know, wow, he wants $100 an hour. You go, okay, is this a $100,000 a year employee? You can, it's, a, it's a really good rule of thumb for me. Um, finally, this is specific to contractors, beware odd jobs. So like those little jobs, like, oh, we just need you to come in for two days and fix our Facebook game. Two days is a pain in the butt because they still need to write the contract. You still need to pay your lawyer to look at it, right? So um, establish for yourself a minimum, like I don't do any jobs that are less than $15,000 or something like that because smaller than a certain amount, they get to be a real, a real hassle. <coughs> All right, enough of the boring stuff, right? Time to open up shop. Um, you've got everything ready. Your framework is ready. You know you're ready to get jobs, and you will be able to. You know you have all the equipment you need and all the help you're going to need. So um, now you're ready to sort of start marketing uh, yourself. And this is also something that applies whether you're a contractor or not. So here's the really. This was eye-opening for me. When you express yourself professionally, 
or whether you're applying for a job or you're talking to somebody to try and do contract work for them or just talking to your boss in the hallway, you're always putting out an appearance, right? A facade of how you are you know, received and perceived by others. So wanting to get out of, um, I was in a sort of serious games position. I was an executive producer for five years on a, another research type project. And I really wanted to get back into game design. And so I made this really, really cool, I thought, resume. And it's like, oh, it's like I took a page out of graph paper notebook and I spilled coffee on it. There's post-its and pencil. And it shows that I'm creative and I'm, I'm a designer type dude. And um, probably about 20% of the people that I sent it to even responded to it. And after a while, um, I, I started following up with the other 80% and going, did you get it? You know, is it cool? And it turns out that it landed on an HR person's desk. And they said, whatever, and had no idea what to do with it. And so it went into the pile of, I might look at it later if I have time. Because when you're an HR person, you want them all to look like that. <laughs> what did I do? Where? For how long? And so I took the same information and I put it into that format. I actually took it right off LinkedIn and did a little doctoring. And all of a sudden, I started getting like twice as many responses I had before because it was in something they could parse. So again, if you go back to the message, write for your audience. If you're writing an email to your boss, your boss has a problem that they're trying to solve. So your email should serve to help them solve their problem. You're writing to a peer, you know? You have, you have a different audience than, you know, than your boss. So think about the form that the information you're putting out there takes. And that's good for contractors or, or you know, employees, doesn't matter. Any questions, cool so far? Okay, so now you're ready to, to launch off into the world. You've got your website, you've got resumes. Now, obviously, I used a resume as an example, but that, that applies to your website. You know, have a, a page for services, have a page for Facebook games, have a page for iOS games. You wanna think about the audiences that are gonna come to your website. You wanna think about the type of work you wanna do, and you wanna have those match up. The way you present that information should excite the kind of client that you're looking for. So, who here thinks that um, they are a fantastic networker? Cool, okay, a few, that's good. Um, who here thinks that networking is what account execs do on, on expense accounts and they spend all this money, it's a huge waste of time? Okay, that's good that nobody raised their hand. At GDC, everyone did. So, uh, you guys are already above that, so that's cool. Okay, the cool news is networking is nothing more complicated than listening to somebody else, chatting with them about your favorite game, like, oh my god, I love Portal 2, this is so awesome. You're just bonding with people, that's actually networking. What you're doing with networking is putting irons in the fire or hooks in the water. You want your name to be out there so that when they're, you know, two weeks from now, they're back at the office and they go, oh my god, I met a guy who does flash programming. Um, and, and so that's all networking is. There is no metric for success. You're just talking to other people who love games. So what I'm trying to do with this is, is to get all of you to walk away with the fact that part of your career, contract or employee, is to network. And it's not that scary. It's just, just geeking on games with people. So that's the cheat code. It's the fun part. It's when you go to parties at PVC and tell them. So a lot of people, because uh, we game folks tend to be a sort of solitary lot, um, <laughs> don't really know how to get started with that. So some ideas. Obviously, if you're at GDC, go to the party. I, I wouldn't do it like that guy's doing it. It's not exactly the kind of notoriety I'm looking for. Um, keep calm and hack. There are a lot of hackathons in this area. Um, go to them and build something. You're going to meet tons of people. You're going to have a, a great weekend experience. Of course, excuse me, you're all in college, so you're probably already busy. But are there any on campus? Are there any happy yeah, on campus? campus? We have game jams. Yeah. There you go. Go to every single game jam. Um, but but especially get outside of campus too. I mean, um, and then LinkedIn, of course, is great. Specifically on LinkedIn, there are game groups. Uh, you should join those and not only listen, but try to participate you know, carefully in, in small doses where you have a, a point, uh, an insightful question or something to add. Um, you want to get your name out there uh, a little bit. And this is a really, really good one. Um, down the road, of course. So some of the folks from the business school at Stanford, ironically, started a video game industry email list. And that is, to my mind, the hidden industry gem. The people on that list are um, you know, CEOs, lead designers, creative directors, the signal to noise ratio is like off the charts. 
So if you want to keep your ear to what's kind of going on in the industry, that's a great, that's a great uh, email list. scares a lot of people too. I don't want to do contract negotiation. So let me demystify it a little bit. I use a three-step process. Three steps. Okay. The first question you have to ask is, can I even do what they want done, right? If you're talking to somebody, they should already be talking about whether it's an iOS title or it's an MMO or whatever. And so if there's like, you know, okay, I would sit down and write the design doc, invent time travel, and then learn JavaScript. <laughs> I don't think we're in good shape there. Um, so uh, the first question you need to ask is, is, can I do what they want done? Not just from a technical perspective, but this is the hardest slide in my whole presentation to kind of get across, so I'm gonna spend a little more time on it. What you're looking for is their itch. They're gonna to come to you with a solution. We need somebody to sit down and write a game design document. And in your head, you need to be going, no you don't. You want somebody to clarify your vision or give you words that you can use to go get funding or your boss thinks you're worthless and you need to do something to justify your existence and if you had a game design document to throw on her desk then you'd be safe. So the trick is to listen while you're negotiating to what they're going to do with what you give them. Okay? They may say we want you to come in and do some screen layouts and you have to be asking why. Why do you want those screen layouts done? That's what helps you get to their itch. Well, we want the screens laid out because our, our users are getting confused and they're all dropping off on this one screen. The reason that you do this is because when you're alone, you know, in a coffee shop working on their work, you have a million decisions to make every day, right? Should I put this, should this be bigger, should this be smaller? If all they say is, you know, do screen layouts for the store of our iOS game, you don't know why they want you to do that. But if you know that what they're trying to do is, is increase click-through on something or um, you know, make it clearer that you have to buy pet food for your pets, that's what guides you to successfully do the work that you need done. And um, this was something that came to me naturally, luckily, I don't know, maybe just from experience. But again, I asked a client and said, you know, what would you want to learn from this talk or what would you want to put in? And this was the quote that he gave me which blew my mind. One thing I noticed is working with another contractor after I left um, is that it's possible to take my directions literally, but that's not really what I want. <laughs> it's like, dude, that's why we put in the contract. Thanks a lot. But it really illustrates that they are asking you to read their mind. That's what game designers have to do as contractors. See, tells you to do A, but what he really wanted was A prime. It looks like A, but it's like made out of fog. So, um, so the concept of the itch is, is to get past what they're telling you they want done and, and try to understand why they want you to do it and why they want it done that way. Is that kind of clear? Because it's, it's really important. Okay, cool. And this also is not just for freelancers, right? If your boss says, you know, we need XYZ in the multiplayer section, we need a new feature, you can always ask yourself why. why uh, is there a problem in the game design that they're trying to solve? Is it a new feature that they think will increase the audience or bring in a different demographic or something? So it's a really good thing to be doing anyway. Um, so you're done with step one of negotiation when you have these things in your hand. You know, you hear what they say they want done and you write down, I need to do this and I need to do this. Uh, let's see, first I would need to open up Word and start a new game design document. I would need to write these six sections. Uh, that one will take two days, maybe three. This one will take four to seven days. And so you have a task list with range estimates. Not this is going to take 16 minutes, right? But it's going to take a half a day to a day. And everything is a range. You add that up and you have like the best, the fastest this job could possibly done and the slowest this job could possibly done depending on when things go crazy on it. You have no blockers in your list. You know how to do every one of the things you've written down. And you have an itch list. So remember I said you're asking yourself why and understanding what itch they're trying to scratch with your work. So when they say something like, we just need to know um, what it will feel like to, to make a purchase. We don't care about frame weight and we don't care about art. You write down, does not care about frame rate, does not care about art. Those are the things that I call your itch list, the things that characterize the work you're gonna do. And you're gonna put those on post-its around your desk because when you're sitting there, like I said, hundreds of decisions a day, should I spend two hours looking on Google Images to get something that represents the world? Oh, nope, does not care about art. Okay, I'm using a gray box, move on. So the itch list is what's with you while you're actually doing the work. 
finally, you want buy-in. You want to kind of go over your task list and say, okay, so it sounds like what you need me to do is this and this, and I'm going to give you this after about two weeks, and then, and then we'll do this next, right? And then he goes like this, or she goes like that. That's buy-in. Yes? So, uh, the Yes, exactly. The itch list is you're going to write down those quotes where you kind of, you know, that little spidey sense tingles and you go, ooh, that's important. I, I want to remember that one. That's right. Okay. Second question is can I do it on their schedule, right? I've got my range estimate and it's going to be between two and three months. Well, I have vacation coming up. I've got to take my car in that one day. Ooh, my kids play. And you start subtracting all those times that are non work times. And that's what gives you your, your deadlines. Like, okay, I can do that for you in three months. It might take as many as four. Is that going to work for you? Because, and the reason that I do this second is because no amount of money makes time go any slower, right? So first, I have a clear picture of what they want done. Second, I know that I can do it in the time they want it done. And on that topic, really quickly, you know, they say time equals money. And when you're doing contract work, especially, Time is sort of the opposite of money. The less time, the more money you get to charge. You know, if, oh my God, this is a rush. We have to have it by the 15th. <laughs> cool. <laughs> That's only three days from now. And then you go like times three because you just gave up your weekend and your sleep. If it, you know, if something blows up, oh my God, I got to reformat my hard drive. And you know, so so that's the uh, that's the way bidding goes. Finally, now you finally get to can I do it for the budget? <laughs> Um, the way that you're going to bid for this work is you're going to say, you know, your bid equals the number of hours you know that it's going to take you to do times your hourly rate. So now you can see everything I've been talking about comes up to this point. This is why you had to figure out up front what your hourly rate is. And this is why you had to write out a task list. You put those two together and you're going to have a range of bids, right? Because we have a range of time times a flat fee. And that's the range where you want to have your negotiations. And that's where it becomes more art than science. You want to kind of decide, well, is this a client that I want to keep for many years? Maybe I'll start towards the lower end. Is this work that doesn't help my career at all? OK, I'll start at the higher end. And then you know, as they negotiate, the cool thing is you now know what your bottom number is. So when they want to negotiate and, and get it for cheaper, you know what the bare minimum amount of time it's going to take you to do is and how much you charge. So you would know when to say, you know, I, just, I don't think this is a good project for me. Let me see if I can find you someone else to do it for that money. So you're done with step three when you have agreement with them and you start drafting the contract. So now this is contract stuff, but it's probably useful to think about because contracts are happening all around you anyway. What do you want in the contracts? So you want to write down what you will do and what you will not do. I'm going to write you a server, but I'm not going to put it online and host it for you. You want to be explicit about where your job is done. You want to be clear about when you're paid. If you're doing contract work, it's very common to ask for 30% upfront you know, on signing so that you have some money in your hand to kind of get you started to the first milestone. It depends on the size. Smaller contracts, you don't do that. And actually, larger contracts, you don't do that, like the government. So, <laughs> um, but generally, for, for game contract work, you know, a couple months, um, it's pretty reasonable. Ask for 30% up front, 50% is then spread out through deliverables you know, during the course of the project, like when I give you the game design, another 25% is due or whatever. And then the last 20%, they usually want to hold off and, and kind of like, well, we want to make sure it's cool before we give the last check. Um, you also want to write when, obviously it's due for milestones. And then you also want to write, uh, you want to warrant your work. Um, usually this has to do with things like, I won't use any fonts that have copyright restrictions, you know, are you allowed to grab any image off of Google Images and slap it in there because it's just for internal use only? You want to be really clear about what you're delivering because if you give them screens and then they put it in their game, you're like, wait, no, 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 that was from like DeviantArt, man. Um, that's no good. Um, maintenance, uh, if there's problems, if it's an ongoing kind of thing, you know, do they have the right to come back to you and say, well, it crashed, you got to fix it. Um, what's your ad hoc rate? It's usually useful to put in there. Um, if we find additional tasks, then I would do you know, one week for X amount of dollars if you kind of put that in there up front, and then they come back and they say, well, what if we do this other work too? You go, that's fine, remember, it's this much per hour or whatever. Um, and finally, you want to put in exceptions. Exceptions are 
what's going to keep you up at night? You know, like they need the design doc and this date, and I can't do the design doc until they give me a working prototype, and I need two weeks after the working prototype to flesh out the rest of the game design doc. So you would put, if I don't get the, the, you know, the prototype by this date, then it's off. Because you want to try to avoid that situation where they give it to you and they go, so can we have it by five, right? Um, so exceptions are, you have to think about that, well, what if this whole thing goes sideways and, and crazy stuff happens? Okay. Ah, the cheat code. Um, when they nod and you're in total agreement, it's not done. It's going to take at least one to two weeks for, you know, they're going to draft a contract and you have to have your lawyer, re you know, review it. Um, and then you have to sign it and get it back. So it's going to take at least one to two weeks to get this thing started before you can really start work. The problem is that you're a hungry design contractor. You need money to buy ramen, right? <laughs> so um, often that's when they'll start throwing in like, no, no, just bear with us because there'll be more work and you can, you, know, you can put it on your resume and all these other soft sell kinds of things. So here's my advice on that. This is from a lead engineer that I worked with at THQ. If you can't scratch a window with it, it isn't compensation. So like, you know, oh, we're going to do like a full year of work with you. Well, then why does the contract say like three weeks? You know, all that other stuff, that dot, dot, dot stuff is usually, well, be very careful with it, right? Finally, you're a business person now. The lawyers are going to review the contract. You're going to decide whether to sign it or not. The lawyers are going to tell you that you shouldn't sign it, and they're going to tell you why. Your job is as a professional to weigh the risks and decide whether or not it's, it's a contract that you want to sign. All right, ready, fight. So um, this is now my little soapbox for everybody here who's going into the game design or to the game industry at all. Go back to the last slide. The last ten things. Go ahead. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, thou shalt always be professional. <laughs> So, oh, I'm so tired of seeing leet speak emails from game designers who are too cool to use the apostrophe rule um, and, and the shift key. So um, this is probably the best advice you can take with you into the game industry. You're shooting yourself in the foot if you, if you are sloppy about your work. I don't care what, you know, what division or, or discipline you're in. Um, just because we make games does not mean that we're not professionals. So end of rant. Um, Back to contracting, but this also applies to um, full-time employees. There's going to be conflict. There's going to be problems on any project. So this is something that is helpful, especially when you're a freelancer because you have no choice. It's basically your fault um, when you're the freelancer. Um, not that it's not partly their fault, but at least part of it is your fault. And that's actually true if you're a full-time employee, too. It, it's just much more useful if you kind of go, okay, well, something happened here. I'm sure I misheard you a little bit. Let's sit down and figure out what this is. That attitude alone is going to just make a huge difference to where you go, contractor or full-time. So as a freelancer, specifically, the first thing you're going to do when there's a problem, you're going to get that email, and your stomach's going to drop out, and you're going to do the, oh, man, they're not going to pay me, and you know, this isn't really what we wanted at all. We don't know why you just did that. And you kind of go, oh, my god, this is, this is a nightmare. So the first thing you do is go back to your itch list. Well, why did I do it that way? Because you said frame rate does not matter. I wrote it down and put quotes, and now you're sending me this email that says, oh, it runs at like four frames a second. Um, so you're going to start with the itch list because you want to find where the problem came from. Is it because I misunderstood? Is it because they're changing the problem? Or is it because um, they're making the problem bigger on you? Regardless of what happens, there's uh, basically three ways you're going to get out of this. Number one is you're going to refine what you're doing. And you're going to kind of go, okay, I hear you. You had a different idea in mind for the chat system. Let me just polish up that one section of the game design doc. I'll get it back to you by five. It's more work than you thought you'd have to do, but you're just going to do it. Okay, so you do a little refinement and there's, it's sort of, you just sort of suck it up. Um, you can renegotiate, and there's a really powerful phrase you can use, the time we have left. Because it reminds them you're on contract with them already, you're doing work for them, and you actually can still do something for them that might give them what they need. So you go, okay, I, I, I hear you. You didn't want a game design document. You wanted a first-person shooter. Hmm. <laughs> okay, so let me see. What I can do for you is maybe I can do a game design document for a first-person shooter in the two weeks that I'm still on contract with you. So you, you want to kind of turn the, you know, that block of time. You want to still do the work for them. You can change what the work is, but the idea is to do the work and get paid, right? 
Sometimes, however, you just, you know, you got to reboot um, where you go, okay, you know what? I don't know how we got off track, but we, we probably should start over. I'm hearing you now tell me that you want this, this, and this. Is that right? Okay, well, I can do that for, and then you kind of start the whole process over, give them a bid, and so on. No matter what, which route you go, you're going to document all the changes. You're going to be the one that sends an email. You know, I'm sorry that uh, you know, this went a little sideways. Per our conversation, here's what we agreed that we're going to do. My next step is this. Your next step is that. So you, you know, no questions. And then finally, master the Socratic method. So um, you know, that's you know, getting to the root of the problem by asking questions. Um, try not to do it where you're implying that the other person has, you know, the IQ of algae, but it's, it's hard sometimes. Um, the, the, the trick is to assume that you're the one that missed something. Um, you want to go in and say, wow, okay, I thought we were making an arcade game here, so I'm not sure if we make the player invulnerable, you know, when do they put in another quarter? I think I'm missing something, you know, and you want to ask it in the form of a question, not, you know, you're, you're a moron, they're never going to put in another quarter, etc. Um, it's very tempting as game designers, the reason I say this, game designers think they, they have the vision in their head and it's, and it's, you know, it's in stone, it can't ever change. Be flexible, open up dialogue, your attitude is everything. One more cheat code, bonus time. Um, as a contractor especially, but this probably applies to a certain amount to employees, um, you're going to get silence. From your, um, from your client. If they don't email you and they don't call, that's actually good news. In, you know, again, I'm talking about on the small you know, one person to three person kind of contract. It means you're the part of their day that isn't on fire. Okay? <laughs> um, so if you're just working along and everything's going good on your side and you're hearing nothing from them, that's a good thing. And what you're going to do in return is you're going to send your daily status emails and you're going to say, just wanted to let you know I made great progress on the combat system, part of the design doc. I am still on track to finish on Friday. As a reminder, I need to meet with you on Monday, right? So you're just making this paper trail. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. Everything's cool. You know what I mean? And if they never get back to you, that means they're telling you, okay, you are good. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna change your course. So that the reason I bring that up is because it freaked me out. Like, oh my God, they want to fire me, they hate me, they hate me. And then I went in to talk to the guy, he's like, oh my God, we love what you do. I don't even have to manage you. And I was like, oh, I get it. <laughs> so last bit, that's it, we're done. Um, if you want, feel free to give me a card. Our information is online, et cetera, like I said. Um, but at this point, I'll open it up for questions. You all seem to still be awake, too. That's cool. <laughs> <laughs> all right, any question at all? I think we have like five minutes, something like that. I'm sorry, I keep moving. This guy with the camera's going to hate me. <laughs> uh, so I'm assuming when you say uh, always be professional, always make sure you're all, uh, also representing your business. Because the big thing is even regardless of who you're working for or if you're working for yourself, if you post up on Twitter, mm. talking about always on, I'm mm. saying any names, but uh, you know, stuff like that might to buy you. Interesting. So yeah, the uh, point of, you know, are you a representative of your company? As a freelancer, 100% no question. Right. When you work for a developer or something, um, it's actually something that happened at our last company where somebody in the Texas office tweeted something about the California office. And it wasn't super nice. Like, oh, I can't stand when I pull code and it looks like spaghetti threw up in the repository, you know? And, and we're like, okay. We're right here, <laughs> and it is that is a deeper question when you know when you're an employee, what right to privacy? Certainly, that you know you can't get in trouble if you assume, you know, 20 years from now your boss is going to read what you wrote. You know, yeah, you're right. You, you definitely can't go wrong being safe. I don't know the legality of what of what right to privacy you have just as an individual and an employee. Certainly, you want to be careful. So that's a good point. Yeah. Okay. Is there specific social media we should be more active in? Like uh, being active on Facebook would seem a little less professional maybe than being active somewhere else. Like so I, I, have a, I have a Facebook account, but it is for personal use. I do I do post things like successes that our, our company has, like when we shipped Frog Bog, which is a cute little iOS game <laughs> that I wrote. Um, but it's really meant for you know my family to know about. It's not a promotional, and I keep that very crisp. I, you know what I mean? Um, but was your question about which media to be on? Do you know of any? Um, well, link, like I said, LinkedIn is, is actually getting 
getting some traction as a good little whirlpool of use, usefulness in the game industry. I I don't use Twitter. I don't get it. I'm trying not to be too too outdated, but um, uh, but yeah, I think link, LinkedIn is a good one to look at, and then that email, this one. Yeah. This is a really good one. Okay, I saw some other hands. Yes. Um, how often do they go off track? Um, not that often. Um, not, not to the like, it blew up and they're not going to pay you kind of a thing. Um, as an independent contractor, I had good success. Everybody paid me. Everybody was happy with what I did. They often had me back. Um, as we started to build Void Alpha, we also do some contract work there. We have had one client who didn't pay us one third of what they owe and they still owe us. Um, and I think that comes down to picking your, picking your clients carefully. Um, but in terms of them being really unhappy with what you're doing, if you, if you have followed the communication pattern that I talked about in terms of understanding what they want, it really, it shouldn't, it shouldn't get so big that it's unfixable. Like ever, really. So, yes. Oh, uh, what's the new? <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, I missed the first part. Uh, best. Th so, if you're going to be if you're going to be late for something, well, yeah. let them know ahead of time. I mean, they get. That, you know, if if you were an employee and it's like, oh, my kid was sick this morning. What are they going to do? Fire you? So think, you know, just same same courtesy you would offer your boss. You know, hey, I had a family thing. Um, here's what I'm going to do about it. You want to communicate and leave it. You don't you don't want to leave it open. You want to say, um, this is the end of the sentence. Like, I, I won't be at this point, but it will be at this point, and there's no reason for them to email you back. Be proactive about it. Yes, behind it. And do you only show your best work on your portfolio? Yes. <laughs> they only, only show your best work. To, to, um, don't show them stuff in progress. It doesn't count. It, it's uh, you really are trying to show your ability to go from a concept to a polished, awesome experience. Not that you can code JavaScript. Right. Um, I saw a few more around there. Uh, no, wait, yeah, yeah. Um, what is uh, average salary like um, compared to working at a company, and uh, what about free time as well? Uh, as a freelancer. All right, so the, the question is about salaries and free time as a freelancer versus an employee. Um, you know, the line looks more like this when you're a freelancer. You know, you, there's, there's boom times and bust times. There's one month where I worked, you know, crazy because I had two clients, and then I ended up taking home a lot of money that basically covered me for three months, and it, it turns out that I needed it. So freelance definitely has a lot more heartburn built into it, um, but it was also nice to work on some projects, you know, of my own. Um, how to give you an answer? Uh, not really sure. I think so. In terms of the salary part, I think you can make the salary work out to be about the same. It's it's a lot of work to be getting gigs and doing the work, but it is going to be more irregular. But in terms of quality of life, I think you, you know the the industry is moving more towards you know hiring contractors, so it's more possible than it was before. All right, two, one or two more questions because I know we got to get going, right? Okay, yes, uh, in the red shirt, and then we'll do the black and the red, yeah. Is there a quiz for this? Yes, and that's what we're going to get to. Um, I know that's why you showed up in the black, yeah. Um, so how much do you really have to know to be a freelancer? Because I don't, I don't know if you what you're saying, but can you, don't you have to be part of the industry for a while to know how everything works? Like, I can't be just graduating, I'm a yeah. freelancer without ever being in the industry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, not necessarily, but mostly, um, especially in game design, right? Because game design is something you really have to learn with your face. You know, you got to go through a whole, as you saw early on. Um, you, you know, game design is harder to sell coming right out of college. Engineering is not. Um, and an engineer with game design sensibilities, there are there are entry level things and you know jobs out there. And there are companies that are like, well, we want to bring in that gem from UC Santa Cruz who can do it all, but we want to tell them that in six months they're fired. And, and there are companies that are starting to actually be honest about that and, and tell you that and write a contract instead of hiring you and then EA spousing you to death, like you know, after you work 80 hour weeks. That's another cool thing. If you're gonna work 80 hour weeks, you priced it into your bid. <laughs> so um, all right, I think we should, is that good or? How are we doing yeah, time? I mean, that's, that's okay, great. Thanks. Thanks, you guys, very much.